Andy. And let me just say it's a pleasure to see so many friends out here today. And I say it honestly because over the years I do believe that I know you all know that we disagree on some things, but hopefully I've always given you the greatest respect. You've done that to me and that I appreciate greatly. I would just say to you, I've had the pleasure of being your mayor for eight years now. I, it's the greatest honor in the world to have grown up in this city, love this city, and then to be able to be the mayor of the city. So I thank you for allowing me to have this job uh, for all these years, and I hope that I'll be able to have the opportunity to continue to do it. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'm Don Weeks, a uh, native of Kempsville. I graduated of Kempsville High School. Right, Dave? Go Chiefs. He's a much younger man than I. More handsome, but anyway, that's, that's life. Hey, I was on the council back in 98. I served one term, led the opposition to the light rail. Uh, so, you know, I've got a bit of an experience on council. Let me just mention quickly, I just left the volleyball court. My twin girls at attend Kempsville Middle School, my old junior high, are playing a little volleyball tonight. So, uh, that's a fun thing as well. I am uh, running for mayor because I want to change the direction of the city. I think we have some much greater needs. One of those being road projects. Any of a road project over Elbow Road uh, needs great attention as soon as possible, and also modernizing our four oversized schools. And I'll talk about more that more about later. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I don't happen to need the mic. I'm kind of a strong voice kind of guy. <laughs> nice to see all you out here today. I'm really, really happy to see so many voters sitting out here today because it's very important that you hear what the candidates have to say. My name is George Furman III. I'm running for mayor. Primarily, I'm running for mayor for one reason and one reason only. I'm running for mayor because, one, every taxpayer has the right to be heard. Right now, is not happening. Certain people get the ear and other people don't get the ear. What I want to do is change that and make sure that you have at least a voice where you need it to have. Because one, every one of you pay a tax. You pay taxes, so you have the right to do so. Thank you very much. George doesn't need a mic. I don't need a mic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Richard R.K. Kowalowicz. And I'm running to be your mayor of Virginia Beach. I ran against Mr. Sessoms four years ago. I started in politics 16 years ago. I started because I didn't like what I was seeing. I didn't like the corruption that was coming up. I don't like it at all. I fought against it for 16 years. I'm the only person in Virginia Beach I know of that's done something about corruption and actually not even been elected and got it done. I'm running because I'm a conservative. I believe in the free enterprise system. I believe corruption is a free enterprise killer. Government doesn't have the right to pick winners and losers, and that's what we're doing in the city of Virginia Beach. We've got to change the way we do business, become more inclusive, we have to be more transparent. I'm asking you guys to help me get in there so I can fix some of these problems, because if you hear me, it's your election, I know I'll work for you, and you can rest assured of one thing. Everybody knows, a lot of people know my passion, and I'm very serious about fixing it, and I can fix it. Please vote for me on November 8th. Well, good evening, Tea Party. My name is Dane Bly, and I'm applying for the job to be your next councilman at large. And I'm asking you to hire me with your vote so that we can reduce the influence of special interest on city council, set new priorities with smarter budgeting so I can be your voice and your vote on city council. Now, the incumbent, Ms. Wilson, is a big government tax and spender. She's given our hard-earned money to special interest, and she's already voted to raise our taxes to bring light rail to Virginia Beach. We can't afford the current majority on city council. So let's help small businesses and working families keep more of their hard earned money. Let's diversify our economy with new, good, high paying jobs, end crony capitalism, and create a level playing field. Let's restore trust and accountability on city council. And let's use common sense and forward thinking to utilize 21st century solutions to our transportation challenges. Again, my name is Dane Bly. I ask you to hire me with your vote on November the 8th. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Pam Witham. I am 32 years old, 
and a Virginia Beach native. I graduated from Princess Anne High School and received my undergraduate degree from Virginia Wesleyan College in International Relations. As I have grown up in this city, I recall telling guests at the hotel that I worked at that this city is turning into something it's not, and that stems from the leaders that we have in our elected office. And that sentiment still holds true today. The issue of bringing a light rail here isn't one that will reduce congestion, and the studies have shown that, so why is this still being pushed? Our education system is running on the idea that if we reduce the standards that our students are given, it'll be fairer. All that will do is continue on with another generation of students who are unprepared for the workforce and who need safe spaces to continue to live. We need leaders who know what it's like to operate on and adhere to a budget. We need leaders who are willing to invest our tax dollars back into existing communities. My name is Pam Witham, and I appreciate your vote this November. Thank you. Oh, good evening, everybody. I'm Bobby Dyer, AKA, AKA Bobby D, and it's a privilege to be here. I have had the privilege of being on city council for the last 12 years, and yes, I am indeed blessed to be unopposed this year, but let me tell you how important I think it is to be here, to continue to build those positive bridges with the community and the groups that you are the fabric, you are the glue that holds this community together. And I am gonna be looking forward to continuing to work with you to build those positive bridges, to increase the amount of business that we have, to make us more fiscally sound and stable, but once again, I really want to sincerely thank you for taking your time to come out and hear us. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Jessica Abbott. I'm running for the Kempsville seat for Virginia Beach City Council. I'm very happy to be here tonight. Um, a little bit about myself. I am, have been running my family's business for the last eight years locally in Kempsville. Um, I, live, I live, work and play in Kempsville. I'm very passionate about our area and I'm excited to be running to represent you um, and, and hopefully earn your support on November 8th. Uh, recently, one of my most proud, one, of, one achievement I'm very proud of, I was actually named uh, Coastal Virginia Business Magazine's Best and Brightest Millennial on the Move. Um, that article's in the back if you're interested in reading it. So I just want to say I'm running to make government more transparent, accessible, and relatable to you, and I hope to earn your support on November 8th. Thank you. Good evening. My name's Robert Dean, and as you can tell, I am not a millennial. <laughs> I'm running for the Rose Hall seat, which everybody citywide can vote for. Most of you know me by my past deeds, my past, I would call, accomplishments. I would urge you to take my brochures that you have, and especially pay attention to this goldenrod. This is a comparative chart on what my opponent, Shannon Kane, and I have in, in opposite the view of government. I have a pledge to you from the very minute after I get elected on November 8th. I pledge I will be of the people, by the people, and for the people, and the Rose Hall seat will not be for sale by any <laughs> banker or developer. All right, we'll start down here. So the microphone is already down here. So this question will be for Mr. Dean, Mrs. Abbott, and Mr. Dyer. Question number one, what is your plan for reducing city debt and your view of borrowing money to pay city expenses? Mr. Dean. Well, one of the things that's always been learned in, the, in capitalism, free enterprise, and in corporate America you never, ever borrow debt or money to pay salary costs or operating expenses, only for capital expansion. We've, we've become out of control in this city, and I attribute that to a lot to the mayor and his, his uh, underlings on city council. Anytime a developer comes in with anything, it's like a snake oil salesman out of the old Wild West, they buy into it and they buy into a lock, stock, and barrel, whether it's $18 million of your tax dollars going into the Cavalier, plus the, the extension of the uh, tax credits, taking it up to about $36 million. My understanding now, Mr. Thompson now wants the mayor and others on council to move and build and extend the boardwalk to his new hotel. 
the town center, hundreds of millions of dollars gone into there. So the debt service, while they say it doesn't come out of the town center because of the TIF, it in fact does because they're not making their numbers. We had another public hearing last night on the arena. The arena failed by, by three votes because it was transfer. <laughs> the, the, the numbers changed and what the public never got to see, and will change on November 8th once myself, Dane, and uh, Jessica get elected. Transparency and honesty in government, we should be able to see, I don't care what the terms are, restrictions, see exactly where all the money is, who's funding it, and why, and I think you'll see it go all the way back to China. Uh, I hope to enjoy, have your vote on November 8th, I'm going to make some honest and open and transparent decisions on your behalf. Thank you. Uh, no, I think it comes down to zero, zero balance budgeting and prioritizing spending. We have to make sure we are funding our core services first. Public safety, our schools, and, and transportation solutions that work, not ones that waste money. We need to be focused on the things that we need to do, and that will solve our problems from the beginning if we're only funding for things. Government's position is to do what the private sector can't. The private sector should be doing everything else. I think we have to take advantage of the low-hanging fruit that we have out there. we got to stimulate small business, and we got to increase it. A number of years ago, and uh, I worked uh, you know, in concert a little bit with Kenny Golden on this, we formed a, 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 a process improvement task force where we bring in some of the intellectual capital. Do you know how, how many great business leaders, how many retired admirals and generals we have you know, working in the city right now? And we just completed a study on the barriers to small business startup and expansion. And do you realize that 75% of the businesses in this country are 30 people and less? So, you know, it's nice to go after the big fish, but you know something? It's the mom and pop operations. You know, the, you know, the why not pizzas. Do you realize that they own six places now and they employ over 400 people? They got mentorship programs and everything like that. So the thing to do is to create the wealth, to increase, increase the revenue streams. We're challenged by the fact that sequestration, the downsizing of the military. Hampton Roads, 46% of, of our gross national product has been directly or indirectly uh, related to uh, the military. My dear friend economist, Doug Walker out there, and I have many discussions on this. Let's go to low-hanging fruit. Let's make it easy to, for people that want to get into business or expand their business, and that way we increase our tax base. Our next question will be for Ms. Whitman, Mr. Blythe, and also Mr. Gwalich. Should body cams be on every officer, and should that footage be available to FOIA? And I'll throw in an addendum to that. If it is going to be available to FOIA, should there be any restrictions or time restrictions on when that footage would then be made available to the public, something that we have seen played out over the past few weeks? That's, that's a really deep question there. That's amazing. Um, my father was a police officer for the city of Norfolk, so this is a, a question that is sensitive for me because I trust our police officers. Are there some bad people out there? Absolutely, there are, but you will have bad people anywhere. Do I think that every police officer needs to be equipped with a body cam? I think that that's something that we need to ask our police department about. If they feel comfortable having body cams on their police officers, for their protection, then that's something that they should tell us that they want. Um, the video footage being released right after incidents that happen, I for one feel that while transparency is something that is crucial, releasing images of a police officer shooting a citizen no matter what the circumstances are, it's just going to cause an uproar, it's going to cause more of a rift. I think that that should be something that we wait upon until all of the facts are known in a case. 
before we release any kind of video footage to the public so the public knows every piece of evidence beforehand. So I don't know about all police officers. I don't know that that's particularly necessary. And I know body cams can be expensive and there's a certain amount of training that goes along with it as well. But certainly I think it's necessary, especially in today's environment. And there is some distrust in certain communities with our police officers, and I know they're working very hard to overcome that, because I think it is important that every citizen in our community feels a sense of justice and righteousness, and that's very important. I know that's what we all want, no matter where we live. Um, so the idea of the FOIAs and releasing them, I do think we have to be smart about it, but yes, the, whatever the, the video camera show, that, that, needs to be, that needs to be shown to the public as well. Maybe in due time, maybe not immediately, because a lot of times there's a lot of misinformation that goes out, so it just has to be used judiciously. But the fact of the matter is, if we're gonna, gonna have the body cams, let's put them to work, make sure we can, we can use them appropriately as well. But our, our police officers, I know, are, are under a tremendous amount of stress these days. So we need to do all that we can to help and support them. And um, it's, they, have, they have a lot of things going on as well. You've got uh, compression, there's pay that, that needs to be worked on. In fact, I would say that I would give that one of the highest priorities um, is, is increasing the pay of our police officers uh, to really truly help them so that they realize the value and how important they are to all of us. And then you have to prioritize spending in government too. And there, there is money. I know that Councilman Moss has always said, that we don't have a, a revenue problem, we have a spending problem. So if you prioritize that spending, public safety being number one, the public education system number two, and then public infrastructure, not including light rail, would be the first. <laughs> it's important to me because blue lives matter. Police officers are crucial for the success of a city, both on the free enterprise system and whatever we do in the future, it creates safe cities, which we are. We require to have good police officers and good trained police officers. I do believe that cameras should be on the police officers. Four-year requests are real important to our freedoms. I support that. I use it a lot myself. But there's times when there are litigations going on that you can't release information. As we've seen in the past here, we've seen how it can work for you or against you. So we have to do our due diligence, the police officer, as the police department does, to make sure that people's rights are not offended. But we also have to secure security as well. So there may be a balancing act we do with it. It's very, very important that the government remains transparent. We shouldn't be hiding anything from anybody. <laughs> Since that topic of body cameras and police interactions has been such an emotional topic over the past couple of years. I want to continue with that topic uh, with our other three candidates here. So Mr. Furman, Mr. Weeks, and also Mr. Sessoms. We'll expand on that topic a little bit. You can also answer this question that everybody else did, or the previous three. Should body cams be on every officer? Should the footage be available to FOIA? And then as an addendum to that, is there anything as mayor that you would like to see or like to pursue that the police department can do better in the city of Virginia Beach? Where is that room uh, for improvement? And as mayor, how would you be able to facilitate that? All right. Um, my father was a police officer too. The thing is with um, body cams is, I believe that right now in the situation that we're in right now, Body cams is not something that we should have. It's something that we need to have. And the only reason, if nothing else, is to protect the officer and to protect the people. The bottom line is you don't know when and where something's going to happen. And if you don't have any way of controlling it or finding out what's going on, then it gets swept under the, under the rug and things happen and people get upset. The bottom line is if people don't feel that they're being treated properly or that they are being taken care of properly, you're going to have unrest. Now, me being an African American, I see it from a different perspective than most other people do. The fact of the matter is, um, racial profiling is something that I, myself, am afraid of. 
So I have issues with that because, one, there's nothing to stop them from doing whatever they want to do. Not to say that the, the Virginia Beach police officers are doing that, but it is something that is of concern of mine. Now, what I would do in reference to trying to fix or take care of the problem is, one, better training, uh, more pay, uh, weeding out the officers that don't need to be there, um, psychiatric um, screening for each, uh, each and every officer so that uh, we can try and find out who and what um, the person is doing. I mean, there are a lot of things that you can do to make people feel more comfortable. My job, if I'm mayor, is to make sure that the people are taken care of at all times, no matter who they are. It doesn't matter what the, the color of their skin or anything in that form of action. Thank you. I'm not sure if body cams for every officer are necessary. Some officers are doing detective work, uh, administrative and other things, but where it's needed, that's fine. The FOIA requests are very complex. There are lots of legalese involved, so I would certainly rely on the police chief and his staff in, in concert with counsel to try to understand the, the best way to pursue that. As mayor, there are three things I would do to help our police department function better as they try to serve us, and it is a tough job. Uh, I think we're, I've heard we're about 80 officers short in the department. A lot of the officers, officers ride alone. A lot of them have said they'd like to have two in the car. I've heard that, so I would uh, certainly make that a priority to get us back up to the level they need. If we're 80 officers short, we try to find those officers. Secondly, I would pay officers more, give them better benefits, and one of those benefits, which is the third item, I'd give every officer in our city and his family a free or a complimentary uh, membership to our rec centers. We have one of the best rec center programs in the area, probably in the state. I think we can all be proud of that. Uh, the leadership is here and other people that are running for office. It's a great, great program. But police officers have great stresses put upon them. And I would give that to them. They, they have a workout center at headquarters. They have a workout center at the old Burnett Elementary, which is police training. But if a gentleman or a lady live over in near Bayside Rec, and they want to go up and swim or take their kids swimming or work out with weights, they don't have time to run over to the headquarters or to Birdneck or whatever. We ought to give every police officer and his family a free membership, complimentary, to our rec centers. The uh, police department has asked for these cameras, and the city council has started to fund them. I believe that the police department will put them in service uh, over a three-year period starting, I believe, this summer. Don't hold me that date, but they have been ordered. As far as information being released, I would ask that the police department and the Commonwealth's attorney and the city attorney come up with a policy, which they're in the process of doing, which everyone will know that policy once it's uh, come up with, and we will abide by that policy. <clears throat> what we can do to, for our police department and we started that in this upcoming budget. We need to hire additional police officers, not to mention the ones that are already available. You know, we got 80 vacancies right now. And the truth of the matter is, you know, a lot of people do not want to go to law enforcement right now. So we're making every effort to do that. But we also want to expand the number of police officers and mainly for community policing. We started community policing 25 years ago in Virginia Beach. I truly believe it's made a difference in our city in the way that our police officers can go into a community, be respected, communicate with, and trusted. That is, you can't put a price on that. And then finally, also have more training. We have about one third of our police officers that are trained for crisis intervention. And that means they deal with the mentally ill. And unfortunately, folks, 25% of the people in the jail right now are mentally ill. A lot of the people that our police department runs into on a daily basis basis or mentally ill. You bring in the crisis intervention trained officer, he can diffuse something, someone who's mentally ill in 30 minutes and not a, a major confrontation. Thank you for your responses. Can everybody hear okay in the back? Yes. Okay. Our next question. Yes, sir. Can I just respond to that? There's something on that last question because I didn't get the full question. It's short to the point. Sure. Okay. I don't need a mic. I just want you all to know, we've been 80 police officers short since the year 2000. So, what's going on? Six or 16 years, we're 80 police officers short. What's happening? That's the kind of leadership that we need to change. 
because especially in today's time, we can't, we can't wait to respond. Would anybody like to respond to that? Very much so. About 30 seconds. We do have police officers that continue to retire as we hire new ones. And also, I will sit back and say to you, we do set the bar very high for our police department, you know. It's not easy to become a police officer. It's a long process. It takes like up to eight to nine months just to be able to qualify. Do we want to take that backwards? I don't believe that we do. I knock on wood saying that the, we got the safest city of our size in the country. Absolute fact. And it's because of the quality of the police officer and the department. Mr. Weeks, Mr. Burning, want to respond? Okay. Our next question, and we're going to head back down to Mr. Dean. Should government stimulate or support small business? Ladies and gentlemen, this nation, this greatest nation on, in the history of mankind probably, was built out of the competitive spirit when we developed this great constitutional republic of ours. Government has no business whatsoever picking winners and losers, deciding who's going to succeed and who's going to fail. Whether, whether you're getting your loans from your local town bank or anywhere else, government has no business involving themselves in the private sector. If you want small businesses to flourish, and that's what this country is all about, tell government to get out of the way. Cut taxes, cut the beepole tax. Most of you know the business professional occupation license tax that's still being levied on businesses, all businesses, lawyers, everybody today, was originally levied to pay for the War of 1812. I think that war has been paid for by now. And so we need to eliminate that. Eliminate all the bureaucracy that we have that you have to go through at, the, at City Hall, through the planning department. I'll give you a little anecdote. I'm president of Green Run Homes Association. We have 16,000 residents, 4,902 homes, swimming pools, everything. We had one swimming pool out of our four that fell in disrepair. All we wanted to do was remove it, take it out of the ground, and take it, haul it off, fill it in with aggregate, plant topsoil and grass seed, have a beautiful passive park, it took us 14 months to fund these regulations that we have down at City Hall. Bureaucracy is the problem here, and I hope to eliminate, along with the help of Mr. John Moss, a great economist. Thank you. Wow. I'd like to echo what Robert said. The only thing government should be doing to stimulate small businesses stepping out of the way. But one of the things that I've worked very hard on the last few years is I started a women's organization to teach young women how to start and open their businesses and then be a support system for you once, once that business has started to take off. It's difficult. It's hard. As somebody who's been running a locally owned family business, there's a lot of things that goes, in, it goes into it. And there are things that you don't learn how to do un until you're in there doing it. So I think we need more leaders on council that, are, that have been there and know what it's like and are already doing the things that, 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 that the private sector needs to help stimulate um, small, small business. And that's stepping out of the way and letting real citizens get in there and do it for each other and do it for themselves. Um, the, the one improvement I think we could, we could do in our school system is tell kids that being an entrepreneur is an option. We have a problem, and that is that we tell kids that they have to go to college. That is their only option. And that is, an, that is a rhetoric that has hurt my generation. And if we don't start telling these kids that you can be your own boss, we won't have any bosses in a, a long time. Well, based on my uh, opening statement, this is a bit of a softball for me because for the last four years, we have the Process Improvement Task Force that has been up and running. And we, are re we realize that we want to change a lot of the barriers that we have, that people getting into business and starting a business. The fact is, a lot of people know how to run a business, but starting a business is a whole different ballgame with the rules, the regulations, the, uh, the accountants, the lawyers and everybody that you have to have. 
But one of the things we have to do is improve the process about people getting into business. And right now we've got about seven major organizations that are working on trying to help the Chamber of Commerce and Opportunity Inc., our own economic development. We have to have a seamless continuum. We have to have a network where somebody can pick up a phone and say, how do I get into business in Virginia Beach and where could I get some help? And the other thing is, too, one of the other projects our project improvement did, and I see Keith Freeman in there, who's a contractor. Uh, you know, I tell you, we are working on improving the planning and permits you know, department in our city. We have to streamline things a lot better, because the quicker we can get businesses open and to get them inspected in a, in a positive way, the quicker that people are hired and people people start making money and we start getting some tax money and so i think that's critical about what we have to do and you know the idea is that we are now in the process of trying to do what we call a little bit we call it in the marine corps an attitude adjustment where we want the city employees to be advocates not adversaries when somebody comes and say what do we got? When do you want to get your business open and what can we do to help you get there? Thank you. This is so much nicer than the debate last night where everybody was talking all over each other. <laughs> so much more enjoyable. You want to change it? <laughs> no. Uh, since the ratings were half of the presidential one, let's not do that. Our next question, and we'll start with Mrs. Widow, uh, and that is, what is your opinion on public-private partnerships? And do you feel they are appropriate for local government? This is an interesting question, because when I hear public-private par partnerships, it kind of sounds like an oxymoron to me. It's either one or the other. Um, I'm right in line with what a lot of the other candidates have said. Government needs to step out of the way um, and they need to let entrepreneurs and the free market dictate the businesses that succeed and the ones that don't. Um, I, for me, like I said, it's, it's just an oxymoron. I don't like the fact that city government can pick the winners and the losers when it comes to businesses that are starting up in the city. No, I think they should be avoided at all costs. I'm a free market kind of guy as well. And you, we should just get government out of the way and let people get out and compete. It is what has made America great, just like Mr. Dean had said. It's that competition, it raises the level for everybody. All of us in business, we know that's what it takes, that you have to work harder. And that is an important point, too, that you have to make sure that government, and that is the role that, that government can play, is that there is a level playing field. So we're not playing favorites, or certain developers get certain tax dollars, other developers don't. A level playing field is extremely important, because otherwise, it creates such a sense that, well, it's who you know, and not what you know, and that, to me, is incredibly destructive, incredibly destructive. And unfortunately, we have some of that going on in this city, and it needs to come to an end. Now you know why I got involved in politics. It's because of public-private partnerships. Government shouldn't be picking winners and losers. A lot of people's room have heard me say it for a lot of years. We've got like businesses collecting a tax to generate their own competition in this city. So if you're a restaurant guy, you, you're collecting a tax that generates your entertainment competition at the beach, you're advertising at the beach, and you get no benefit from the tax, tax, the tax you're collecting. This is crazy. This, what separates us from all the rest of the world is the free enterprise systems. That's why people come here, because you have the right to compete fairly. Government should be out of the way. They shouldn't be competing with it. My opponent, that's Mr. Public-Private Partner there. That's why he has $600,000 in the bank now. It's twice as much as all the other candidates and all the races together because his buddies can give him big money to get millions of dollars of perks from the city. And he's done it time and time again. The Cavalier deal, 31st Street deal twice. Where does it end? Light rail. Light rail. All the way through, we're playing a silly game. Why are we spending three or four hundred million dollars on light rail? Because a billion dollars worth of land projects so his buddies at the bank can benefit. That's what's going on here. 
convicted from public corruption. He's running again. He got on TV and said, hey, it's going to happen again. I didn't do anything wrong, but it's going to happen again on Channel 10 and Channel 13. This is crazy. we got to stop this. We don't need it. We did better business before we started getting into business, where the government was picking winners and losers. And listen to me. I've been in business for 33 years. I almost know every single business person at the beach. I will stop it, and I will stop it immediately. And Mayor Sessions, since you were personally addressing that, you can respond to that in your next question. Thank you. Who remembers Pembroke Mall 15 or 20 years ago? How did it look? Sad. Very sad. We started Town Center 15 or 20 years ago. And yes, we took money from local tax money, and we financed roads and parking garages. The infrastructure around the buildings. The buildings were built by the private sector. The revenue from the real estate tax pays the debt on the money that we funded around town center being the roads and the parking garages. The additional taxes from the restaurants, the hotel, is $7 million a year. That's after everything's paid from the real estate tax paying the investment the city made. Then think about what Pembroke Mall just did on its 50th year anniversary just a few months ago. Have you been by there? Mm -hmm. It's revived, isn't it? No. And we didn't put any money, we did not put one penny in Pembroke Mall, but because of what occurred around it, it allowed for Pembroke Mall to flourish. Let me say to you, across the country, malls are failing. We have two malls in Virginia Beach, Lynn Haven and Pembroke and they're both flourishing. All right, for the equality of time, I'll limit this next question to Mr. Furman and Mr. Weeks. And that question is, and we've seen a lot of this in the newspaper recently, when you look at the economic revival in this area, compared to other parts of the state, compared to other cities that are like, uh, of similar size, to Hampton Roads, that we have been behind in that economic recovery. And the reasons are plentiful. So now they're trying to, making, to, making sure we have this push of integrating the seven cities around them. With that in mind, the question is, what business besides tourism, the port, and federal employment do you plan to bring to our city and how? Mr. Weeks, we'll start with you. We've got to do a better job in economic development, first of all, we need to retain the companies that are already here. Movement Mortgage is a prime example. They were headquartered over in uh, Oceana uh, Industrial Park. They were expanding uh, greatly. They're a tremendous success story. And I've talked to a developer who wanted to keep them here, and he needed to build a parking garage. Uh, he needed a variance. He didn't get much help from the Economic Development Department from more here. So first of all, we've got to retain the companies that are here that are doing well. Certainly high tech. We've gotten to start in biomedical out near uh, Princess Anne, and that's a good start. I agree with that. Uh, we've just got to be better in economic <laughs> development, plain and simple. I'd like to go back and address, if I could, government being involved in small business or stimulating the question. I think government can play a role, uh, and I'll be very precise about it, in helping minorities and women-owned businesses, those people that have been disadvantaged over the years. I'm, I'm you know, I've been blessed. I'm, got a fairly successful business. I've been working hard at it for years, small business. But uh, minorities and women uh, have been kind of shortchanged. And I think government can play a role, again, very specifically. Uh, government can borrow money and lend it out at lower interest rates. There are a couple things that can be done. So I, uh, I want to just hold that up to you as an idea as well. Can I? Because you mentioned something. Yeah. Mr. Furman and then Mr. Okay, right. <laughs> Well, the way to increase or build up the economy is first to build up your infrastructure. Now, the bottom line is this right here. Roads and streets, schools, and police force are the main things that people come to see or to live in this area. Those are the things that they're looking for. Well, if you want people to come to an area, you have to make it what you call attractive to them 
whereas they want to come and they want to stay. Now, the other thing that I see would be a, it is an issue or a problem is right now we're being taxed right out of our back pocket right into the Never Never Land. Okay, I don't know about you, but my problem is very simple. I live here, but how to say I'm not rich. I'm poor. I'm gonna be honest with you. And the, the fact of the matter is that my taxes have gone up almost 60 to 70 to 80 percent. My water bill has gone up 116 percent. I mean, and let's be realistic. I can't afford that, and it's continuing to go up. And the bottom line is, those are the things that we need to do to build up the economy to get that started. But on top of that, the big businesses in here, you also got to give them an incentive to come here. The biggest incentive, like what I was saying right now, if you want certain businesses to come in, a smaller business to come in, you give them a tax break. A tax break for maybe two to three years, whereas they can, you know, build themselves up, especially the small businesses, build themselves up, get to a certain point, and then after three or, year, three or four years, they can start paying taxes so they can, you know, help themselves out. And the bottom line is, we have to help businesses help themselves. Thank you very much. Okay. So, yeah, if, if I could, on, on both those things, and I'm, I'm glad they were both brought up, and I'm glad Don mentioned like Movement Mortgage. The last thing I want to do is see Movement Mortgage leave Virginia Beach as a first class company. Bottom line is they left because there was so much money thrown at them from a different state and another city in, in, in Hampton Roads that that's the reason they left. We tried to get in the game, but we have to make a solid business decision. And you know, you can't throw money and then not have a return on it. And that's where the point got. We didn't do it. Others did. On the real estate tax that you know, Mr. Foreman, Foreman just mentioned, he must have a heck of a nice house. It was two years ago that we finally got our real estate tax revenue up to where it was six years ago. That real estate tax had been going that way starting in 2008. And it was just two years ago, as far as the city, for every real estate tax dollar that's come in, that we got about equal to what it was in 2008. Mr. Furman, since you were mentioned, do you want to respond to that at all? About 30 seconds. <laughs> The bottom line is, I live in a very modest townhouse, okay? I don't live in a big extravagant house. I told you I am poor. That part has already been stated, okay? Let's be real. And the bottom line is, I wouldn't be complaining if I had a whole bunch of money. The bottom line is, I'm a citizen just like everybody else in here, and I believe that as a taxpayer, I should have a tax rate that is economically sound or not be feed out of my back pocket so badly that I'm crying all the way to the bank. I, I thought that's my problem. Your taxes went up 60 percent. Your tax, your real estate tax. Well, they turn into fees. That's the problem. Ooh. I thought you said real estate tax. Ooh. I didn't say real estate taxes. I well, said my mistake. Home. No, that was. I'm talking about they're just my regular mistake. taxes. My right? Thank and you. Just to uh, make our candidates feel better, there's not a question in here asking you to release your tax returns. <laughs> And as we move down, if there's something you wanted to respond to yes. from a previous question, you can do that and add it on to a question we've got coming up, okay? Mr. Dean, what is your plan for reducing traffic congestion in our city? <laughs> Dave Parker's favorite subject on WNIS 790, 10 a.m., Monday through Friday. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we currently have around half a billion dollars of backlog of inner city road projects. If this light rail project goes forward, I don't know how many years that's going to push that back. We did a study on it. $6.6 .6 million of your tax dollars, 3,782 pages of the draft environmental impact statement and Mr. Sessoms and the rest of the council, with the exception of Mr. Moss, I may add, said, forget that. Let's take that study and throw it in the trash. We're going to move ahead. 
with light rail at any cost. And what they did was they raised your taxes and they, in order to help pay for rail cars, I think the deadline's December 31st to buy two rail cars without uh, snow piles on them, <laughs> they also reduced and took away real estate tax relief for the elderly and disabled. Yes. My opponent voted for that. And while after she voted for the tax increase to fund this budget, she turned around and said, well, I want to form a committee to study the utility tax. There's something wrong with this flawed logic. I, I, I thought I knew numbers, but I don't know their numbers now. This city is out of control. The thing that's going to stimulate this city and to bring traffic congestion under control is reducing taxes. The future is not with light rail. It's for autonomous cars, Uber. But we've got to provide good, sound roads for all of our automobiles, which are all just under 500,000 automobiles registered in the city of Virginia Beach. It's a little difficult to follow Robert. He likes to take up all the good facts. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I don't think light rail is a good solution to our traffic congestion problem. Um, and in fairness to that, our growth has been pretty stagnant um, over the last decade or so. So when I hear these projections that we're going to have this booming growth and this outrageous uh, congestion issue, it's a, it's a little uh, mind-boggling since we're not we're just kind of hanging out in, in terms of growth. But what I'd like to see is our bus stops be actual bus stops, not sticks in the ground with a sign on them. <laughs> I talked to a lot of people who use the bus system. They run uh, ir on irregular time uh, almost half the time. They are inconvenient to stand at. You just you kind of go wander over and find a pole and you hope you're in the right spot and you're catching the right bus because it's not clearly marked. And in the winter time and in the dead summer, who wants to stand out there and use public transportation? We really need to put a focus on the bus systems because that's what people use. People use buses because it can get them anywhere in the city, not just from point A to point B. And if we want a serious conversation about who needs public transportation, we would be putting 100% of our focus on how to make the bus system better for the people who use public transportation. Now, you all know I live way on the other side of town in scenic Centerville out there. Now, one thing I am blessed, I am the landfill baron. You know, we got the landfill out there. And we also got population density. We got the highest traffic count. In the city is right in front of Founders Inn, 104,000 cars a day. That one segment that goes from 64 to Centerville Turnpike, which is about a block, is up there. And what we've been able to do uh, over the years, the council, we've been able to dedicate around $92 million of road projects going in. If you remember Lynn Haven Parkway, that's been a dotted line on the map since 1978, is going through. It's going to be opening in December. And I'll tell you, it's going to increase emergency response time significantly to the people in the Alexandria, Brigadoon, and Charlestown part of the city. We're also going to be widening Centerville Turnpike. Uh, from where CBN is all the way to the uh, Chesapeake border. I call that the mini Southeastern Expressway. And uh, the other thing is we got the worst intersection in the city at Indian River and um, Kempsville Road. We're going to reconfigure that to try to make it a little bit more patent. It's important that we have patent roads for emergency response purposes. How much time do I have? 40 seconds. 40 seconds. I just want to say one of the challenges we have with these type of projects that have, and you know, forgive me, I know Dr. Walker from my days as a professor of government. I'm down to 30 seconds. The important part that we got to realize that cities are going to become epicenters of government. We're getting less money from the feds with that obscene uh, national debt. We're not getting the money from uh, Richmond like we used to. The point is we got to start thinking about creating our own wealth, be more effective, more efficient. Thank you. And a reminder to our candidate, you have two minutes to respond. If you want to spend part of that time on the question I'm about to ask you, come back to a previous question. That's fair game. Next question. Will you give city workers a pay raise? What percentage would that be? And, of course, I would add, how would you pay for that? All the good ones. <laughs> 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 
Wow, so I think that when you talk about raises for city employees, you, there's, there's so many different factors that go into it that, you, that it's not a one size fit all kind of deal. Um, so you really have to research it and see. For me, I think the priority would be who has not had an increase first um, and go from there.